Good. So we have seen that the Internet of Things is about data. Okay. So gathering data from some source and then doing something with the data. And we still do not know very well what to do with the data itself. Okay. But you are studying, for example, during the lectures, you are studying protocols and ways to make this gathering of data uh, as efficient as possible. Okay. Or uh, we are expecting that this data will be generated by objects, okay, everyday objects, not only sensors of particular types that are deployed in uh, environments, but you know, real life everyday objects like uh, T-shirts, uh, books, uh, CDs, uh, electronic appliances like fridges, washing machines, this kind of stuff, okay. Every object which uh, will have an internet connection will generate data and will basically act as a source of data. Okay. Now, you, you can think that we are talking about a massive amount of data here. Okay. So think about the numbers we are talking about. Okay. So you should know that uh, for the Internet of Things we need IPv6 because IPv4 does not let's say, cover enough addresses for all the things we want to connect to the internet, right? You should have seen IPv6 during the lectures, right? Or not? Have you seen IPv6? Yeah. Not yet? Well, um, so let me just do this brief, brief uh, uh, introduction. You are basically used to work with IPv4 addresses, okay? Like these uh, four uh, numbers uh, from 0 to 255 which identify, identify a host in a network, okay? Like 192.168.0.1, okay? This is the IPv4 version 4 address. Now, by using that representation, basically, we cannot cover the amount of objects that we would like to connect to the internet because the address space is limited. That's why we need to use longer addresses which are IPv6 addresses. We'll basically um, go from 32 bits of the IPv4 to 128 bits of, of the IPv6 addresses. Now with 128 bits in an address we can basically uh, cover we, we can give an address to every atom of 100 and plus Earths, okay? So it, it's really a huge amount of addresses that we have, okay? So we are expecting to be safe for, for what concerns our planet at least, okay? Maybe if we colonize er, the, the moon or Mars, then we may start assigning addresses also to objects on other planets, but at least for what concerns Earth, we should be okay, okay? So we, we have a lot of addresses to give to objects and each, basically, object will use this address to be connected to the internet. And some people did a quite estimate on what would be the amount of data that would be generated by, by such a, a, a great uh, amount of devices, okay? And it turned out that Recent estimates say that we will have 4.4 zettabytes. I, I didn't actually know what a, what a zettabyte was because it's so huge, which is basically 10 to the 21 bytes, so something really, really big, of data generated only by IoT devices by 2020. Okay, and if you let's say take this and you transpose it to some, something more physically uh, understandable, actually this 4.4 zettabytes, it's like a stack of 128 gigabytes iPad Air from the Earth to the Moon, okay? That's the amount of data we are talking about. So it's a lot of data, basically. That's just for saying that. Now, how do we manage such a massive amount of data, okay? <laughs> Of course, well, that's, we, we cannot think about one single entity, okay, one single organization or one single company managing all this amount of data. That would be 
possible, even for Google. Okay. So it it's basically uh, clear that everyone that is working in the IoT world or is connected to the IoT world somehow will basically have two solutions for managing this huge amount of data. Okay. One is to use an ad hoc solution that is basically each one will manage the data it is producing. Okay. So if I'm a, let's say, a small uh, enterprise and I'm selling some particular IoT device, then I will uh, also provide the way of managing the data that these devices are producing. Okay. Um, well, that is probably good if you, uh, let's say, are self-contained, but it, it will become very, very difficult to maintain once you scale. Okay. Once you start selling a lot of devices and once, once your, your basically company grows. Okay. So what basically everyone has understood now is that the only viable way of managing such great amount of data is by going to the cloud. Okay. So by using services, services for managing data that someone else is uh, developing and controlling. Okay. Why? Well, basically because by doing this we decouple the data production with the data managing phase. Okay. And generally by dividing a problem it's easier to control it. Okay. <clears throat> so what's, what would be a set of uh, desired features for uh, a good solution which is in the cloud and which basically is uh, uh, good enough for storing the data that our IoT application is producing? Well, first of all, it should be easy or very easy, let's say trivial, to make a connection from the system which is producing the data and the system which is collecting and managing the data. Okay? So the link between the two systems should be as easy as possible. Always because since we are now working in a separated scenario, okay, we have probably two different entities controlling the system which is generating the data and the system which is managing the data, then we don't want to waste a lot of time in setting up the interface between these two different separated systems. Okay. So we should really, uh, we would really want that the connection between our system and the cloud is as easy as possible. Of course, once we have connected a device, we would like to being able to store the data at least, so all the data that we produce should be uh, safely stored somewhere and as developer of applications we really do not want or we would like not to care about how to manage in this data, okay? We do not want to, uh, let's say, care about or oh, I have to do a backup of the data because maybe some error is coming inside I don't want to, let's say, uh, be stressed about, uh, you know, buying more hard disks for, for, for storing my data. I, I just want to send the data I produce somewhere where it's safe to be. Basically. And at the same time, I would like to retrieve past data, okay? So maybe in one year, I want to access to my old set of data to, for example, make comparisons, okay? to find patterns, make correlations, compute correlations. So we really, really would like to retrieve also past data, okay? Easily, as in, in a database system. Uh, another nice feature could be the possibility to make decisions directly where the data is stored, okay? So without retrieving the data and processing it, but by doing the processing directly where the data is stored. For example, uh, we may would like to have the possibility of implementing some particular, let's say, software, uh, piece of software 
that triggers an alarm whenever our data is, uh, um, let's say, um, for example, there's a particular pattern in our data or simply our data is exceeding some thresholds. Okay, think about the temperature. Maybe we would like to have some sort of decisions in the cloud when our temperature data exceed a threshold. So we want to, for example, raise an alarm or performing other kind of activities. And of course, we would like also to have easy access to this data in terms of visualization. Okay, Maybe we would like to have nice graphs about uh, uh, the, the, the behavior of the data. We would like to share it to other users so that we can maybe join forces with other companies and see whether there are patterns in the data or just correlations that may be interesting to exploit. Okay? And finally, we would also, well, this is connected to making decisions. We would also like to actuate from the cloud. That is, actuate means controlling other devices based on the data that we are accumulating. Okay. So thinking again back about the example of the temperature, we, we may want to, for example, activate a ventilation system if the temperature uh, exceeds a particular threshold. Okay. And it would be great if we, if we could do this directly from the cloud, and not by, um, let's say, developing our own application that does it. Okay. So this is, let's say, a set of um, features that would, we would like to have. And um, now, can you, without thinking about IoT, so without thinking about devices that produce, uh, let's say, measurements, can you name at least one or two very, very famous systems that allows you to store, retrieve, and share uh, information without actually caring about this, this data is managed? <laughs> yeah, of course, they are cloud systems, but name one or two. Exactly, Dropbox, Google Drive, all, all these kind of systems are basically similar to what we would like to have for the Internet of Things. Now, for these systems, we are basically sharing documents, or let's say that the kind of data that we are sharing is human readable data, okay? Uh, documents, worksheets, pictures, uh, files in general, which are, let's say, of some use to a person, okay? And we would like to extend this um, general scenario to data which is produced by objects and not by human, okay? So that's basically the link, if you want, between the two cloud architectures, the one for humans and the one for objects. And of course, the big difference is that in a cloud system like Dropbox or Google Drive, then there's always a human which is accessing the data and doing something with the data, okay? Maybe, I don't know, when I notice that my colleague uploaded a, a document, I may go there, maybe I get a, a notification, but I may go there and check the documents and see what's inside the document. Here we would like to have a software that goes inside the data and automatically monitors what the data is uh, telling us, okay? So we would like to automate all this process, and for doing this, we will see that there are several solutions available already, okay, to be used. So, <clears throat> let's say I originally I put this slide uh, as first, but I think that now I would like to talk about this, okay, first. Why? Because these are the solutions for IoT data management that the so-called big giants are adopting now, okay? And this is, <coughs> these services are basically, you have to pay for accessing them, okay? So this is, these are services that companies may uh, subscribe to with these big players, and these platforms, which are basically software platforms, allows a company or a private uh, user 
to store data, analyze data, and all the things that we have said before. Okay. So we have IBM Bluemix IoT Cloud, which is one very, very popular name now. Uh, Microsoft Azure IoT Suite, very similar to Bluemix. Okay. Then also Amazon with the uh, IoT system, basically. These are all cloud services, okay? Um, Google uh, just uh, put out the cloud IoT and the Brillo uh, platform. You can check it out. Intel has its own IoT platform. Again, it's a software platform where you can access, put some data, uh, manage the data, and so on and so forth. And so these are what big companies have started putting out. And these are all very, very new products, okay? So let's say starting from 2000, uh, early 2015 to up to now, okay? Very new stuff. And of course, you have to pay in order to use it. There are some free accounts for students, so you may check them out if you can get an account here. But it's mostly, it's mostly, uh, the target is mostly for companies, okay? Small comp small or medium enterprises that want a trusty solution, okay? So a solution from a well-known brand, a well-known name to manage their data, basically. And what for, for us poor uh, students and researchers? So how can we play with this kind of technologies? Well, luckily, there's a complete set of solutions which are, well, not that powerful, but at least they are free and we can use them, okay? And this is a list, well, not comprehensive, but let's say these are some of the cloud solutions which are freely accessible to anyone, okay? And we'll start to uh, play with them today, with at least two of them, okay? Actually, the first one, which is Xively, which I will describe uh, quite in, uh, uh, in details, was probably the first free accessible cloud system for IoT out there. It started in 2007, okay, so quite early for the times. And it was actually open to everyone until last year, when they noticed that they could make a profit out of the platform. So now, basically, this system is, uh, well, was acquired by a company, and they do not provide free accounts anymore. I just discovered it. So basically, now the process is a little bit more tricky. You have to basically send an email and say that you are a student, that you want to try a little bit their system, and hopefully they will give you an account, okay? While the second one, ThinkSpeak, is completely open. That's a good news because you can just go there and make an account with no you know, request and this kind of stuff. And the two systems, Xively and ThinkSpeak, are basically the same, okay? They work really, they, they are very similar, okay? So we will, uh, let's say, spend a little time on Xively today, understanding what are the capabilities, and uh, we will use, I, I, I'll show you with my account, which is an old account, how to use it. And we will also do the same for ThingSpeak so that you can start actually generating data and putting data online if you want, okay? But there are also other... Now, I discovered this nice website, which is the same website I used, you remember, to show you some of the applications, uh, latest application in the IoT, like the baby monitor, the concrete sensor, this kind of stuff. This is a very nice website to track what's, what's happening in the Internet of Things, okay? As you can imagine, since it's a very hot topic, things are rapidly evolving. So it's some, sometimes it's really hard to track all the evolutions of this uh, world. So this is a good site to have in the bookmarks, basically, okay? to go there from time to time. <coughs> And if you go here on this link, there are like a dozen of different platforms that basically more or less offer services like these ones, okay? So possibility of storing data, managing data, uh, retrieve past data, and this kind of stuff. Any questions so far? Your Wi-Fi is on, right? 
Okay. So let's talk a little bit about Xavi. Let's see in details what it's about, okay? So as I was saying, it was created in 2007. Actually, the first name was Patch B, which means basically it's an acronym for Patch Pay, which is a system where you have cables and you connect different system inputs and outputs. Then it became Cosm, and then it became Xively. They basically changed name a lot of times until they basically were acquired by this company. So some money started to, to gain in, basically. What are the main services? Well, I'm sort of repeating myself, but the main services are storing data, okay? So from devices, devices sensors, and in general, environments, okay? And once the data are stored on the system, you can basically share data to other users of the system. So you can serve this data to other entities in other parts of the world, basically. So just to give you an example on why these two things are interesting, even if they may seem very, very trivial, uh, in 2011, after Fukushima, I guess you remember the, the earthquake with the tsunami and the uh, basically radiation problem they had, People in Japan started using Xavli to basically interlink Geiger counters, which are the sensor for basically radiation fallout, okay, across Japan to monitor how this fallout was evolving, okay. This was a completely, let's say, uh, non-official activity that started from people just because people had access to this cloud service, okay. So they were basically putting data coming from these Geiger counters online in order to see whether there were places in Japan where this fallout was, uh, let's say, dangerous or not, basically. <clears throat> now, what are the application scenarios apart from monitoring? Okay, well, there are many, basically. Um, well, we have this big field which is environmental monitoring, so getting data from an environment which, which can be a natural environment or a, let's say a civilized environment, okay? And we can look at the data and try to monitor the data in order to see whether dangerous events are uh, coming in. We can use it as a home automation system, okay? Monitoring, for example, temperature and intensity of light in an ambient, or for example, uh, quality of air in an ambient, and then triggering activities reacting to possible changes in the data. Um, remote control system, building management system, so all possible systems where you can automate somehow the process of analyzing a series of data, of data basically. <clears throat> As a system per se, sadly it's quite simple, okay? You have inputs, okay, which is generally data retrieved from a sensor of some type. It can be a sensor network or some other device. For example, today when we do a test with the virtual machine, we will just use the laptop as a sensor, okay? So it could be any sensor, basically. <clears throat> and so these are the inputs, and you can input any kind of data, okay? Uh, temperature, car consumption, bidimensional data like location, okay? Not only scalar data. Accelerometer data, whatever you want. Basically, you're not forced to stick to a particular type of data. And the outputs of Xively are dynamic graphs, okay, so you actually see the periodic evolution of your data. Um, you can attach a monitoring and analysis API, so an application program interface to analyze your data. And it's also nice because you can perform sort of uh, actuation from the cloud, so you can attach <laughs> triggered events in the cloud and you can, for example, send emails or uh, tweet or, or make tweets on Twitter when your data follows a particular pattern, okay? So you can automate somehow the process of monitoring 
and react to uh, evolution of data. <clears throat> now, it, it has a nice set of features. Well, always keep in mind that the things I'm saying for Xively also hold for the other platform that we have seen, okay? So I'm basically using this as an example of all the systems that are out there, which are more or less similar. So um, the, the main features of Xively and also of other systems like it is, is that basically you can use basically all the major programming languages to interface with this system, okay? And it's very easy to use. We will see an example in just a uh, uh, couple of line of lines of code I can put the data on the website, basically. Uh, the management is very simple, it's scalable and it has nice performance when overloaded with a lot of data. It's technology agnostic, meaning that uh, basically it's being based on, on, on a cloud system, okay, it, it, you can input the data with any technology that you want, basically. You're not stick to using a particular technology apart from, uh, let's say, the um, interface communication that we will look, we will, uh, uh, look in, a, in a while. And it's secure, so basically you have a way of protecting your data and avoid that other users access your data if you don't want them to access to data. <clears throat> okay, so let's, uh, a little bit of terminology before and then I would like to, to move directly to the examples maybe, so that the ones of you which has a PC may also start playing a little bit. So when you open an account on Xively or on Beamspeak or any other of these uh, cloud platform, you generally have the possibility of creating environments, okay? And depending on the system, these environments take different names. For example, in Xively, we have feeds. In ThingSpeak, we will have channels, but I mean, the concept is the same. The idea is that a feed represents a particular physical environment, okay? For example, a particular office, a house, a forest, a river, okay? It can be also very big uh, uh, environments, like uh, an entire city, okay? But let's say you are free to, let's say, give to this feed the meaning you, you want, basically. You're not forced to, to localize your feed in a particular place or to make it of a particular size. Inside the feed, that is inside the environment, you can set up different data streams or channels, okay? And again, Depending on the platform, this may have a different name. The idea is that inside your environment, you have different type of sensors, okay? For example, take the office environment. You can have the temperature sensor, the light sensor, the humidity sensor, each one producing data, and each one will become a data stream, okay? So you have the feed, which is basically a collection of data stream. Each data stream represents a physical measurement. And of course, well, we will see that uh, in order for this to be created validly, you have to respect some attributes. So you have to give a title, an ID, a status, but very simple stuff. I don't want to waste time in this, uh, let's say, implementation details. <clears throat> Okay, so we have this data stream or channels. I will use the name, uh, the, the same name, let's say. <clears throat> and as I was saying, a channel represents an, indiv an individual sensor or device in the environment. Okay, and again, here you have some required attributes like the ID of the data stream or the ID of the channel, the value, starting value of the channel, which may be also be something not meaningful. And of course, then you have other attributes like uh, some keywords that you can add to your channel so that other people can find your data by searching for the keywords. Of course, you have units and unit symbols depending on the data you are putting on that channel. For example, if you are storing temperature, you will have, for example, 
degrees here, Celsius or Fahrenheit, whatever. You can specify a mean value or, or a max value, okay? Uh, and we will see that you can use these values as thresholds to set up triggers and setups allowed, basically. Uh, if this may sound a little bit strange to you, it will be very clear when we see the example, okay? So don't worry about that. Now, an important thing is how we communicate with the system, okay? So imagine that we have a sensor which is able to produce data, and for example, to transmit this data to an endpoint, okay? And we would like to take this data and put it online on our feed in a particular channel that we have created. How we do that? Well, all operations in Xively, but also in other systems similar to Xively, are gener generally done via a RESTful interface that is basically via HTTP commands, okay? So what, do you know what, what a RESTful uh, interfaces? No? Well, w very, very briefly. All resources that you have are uniquely addressable through a URL, so through an address which is basically a link, okay? So your data stream will be a link, a particular link, okay? Your feed will be a particular link as well. And these resources may be manipulated, meaning that you can create them, read, update, delete these resources via HTTP requests, okay? So by using the HTTP protocol. And now, depending on the implementation, we may use different HTTP methods, I guess. Do you follow me on HTTP methods? Like post, get, put, or delete? to basically modify these resources. We will see examples of this as, as well. And the data to modify the resources via this request is generally passed through a textual document in well-known representations, like HTML documents or JSON documents or simply CSV files, where basically you store your data, okay? So the general idea is if I want my sensor to modify the data inside a channel, I somehow have to um, use an HTTP request passing one of these documents with the data inside. Okay? That's what happens basically. So by agreeing on this way of communication, then the rest of the architecture can be completely technology agnostic. Okay? All the layers can be basically uh, done as you wish, as long as you have, of course, TCP, IP, and HTML. HTTP, sorry. So what are these basic operations? Well, as uh, should be clear now, we can create, delete, or update a feed, that is our environment. And inside the feed, we can create, delete, or update a channel or a data stream. We can perform HTTP requests to list and view particular feeds or feeds which have particular uh, tags inside. For example, I would like to see all feeds which have temperature in their tags, for example. And all these operations may be performed directly with, the, with HTTP requests and on the Xively website there's a clear documentation on, on how to do this. Or we may use the provided libraries, okay, which are available for any programming language, basically. And what this library do, it's basically they embed the HTTP requests in the programming language of, that we have chosen, basically. Now, to look at what kind of programming languages are available, um, there's this link here. Okay, so you have libraries for Android, Arduino, C, J, 
Java, JavaScript, Objective-C, PHP, basically everything, okay? Python, Ruby, okay? So today, for example, when I show you the examples, I will uh, perform a very, very simple example using C and Python, okay? Just two very simple examples. But, I mean, depending on what you are developing, you can use any one of these languages. And this holds also for TeamSpeak, for the other platform, the one which is completely accessible. Okay? Now, why it's like this? Well, basically before, because the actual communication is done via HTTP. Okay? So all these libraries are doing nothing but embedding these HTTP requests inside them functionalities. So very easy, basically. Yes? Uh, not, I mean, it's completely, let's say, shadow to the user. I mean, you don't have to worry about that. We will see in a while that you have very, very simple primitives to control uh, permissions, basically, on your data. But uh, as long, since this is based on HTTPS, basically, you already have authentication and this kind of stuff. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay, so when you start playing with this kind of stuff, first of all you have to create a feed, okay? And you can either do it by issuing the HTTP request, or if you're lazy, just like me, you can just go to the website and there's a nice graphical interface to get started with this, okay? So let's say as a first step, it's good to go there and try to create a feed directly from the web page. So let's try to do an example now. <coughs> and see how we can set up a feed. So, I just want to show you this and then we can <clears throat> So if I log in here Okay, it's already, this is my page, okay, I have already two feeds here but I can create another one. For example, I can call it office, put some description here. I can make it private or public, and of course this can be something that only, uh, it, it's basically visible only, only by me or by all other users. Well, we can make it public. And that's basically the feed. Now it's um, empty. But I can start adding channels, okay? These channels, these data streams, each one per sensor that I have in my office in this case, okay? So for example, I can add a channel, uh, for example, sensor number zero. This could be temperature sensor, okay? This could be, I don't know, Celsius, like this. Can save the channel. Well, now I have no data points here, okay? Because I didn't put any data, but at least I have created my feed and my channel, okay? And as you can see, this looks like a standard web page, but in reality, this is already ready to uh, collect our data, okay? We will look at an example in a few seconds, basically. <clears throat> so, you can, you can do it graphically, as I already did, or you can create an HTTP post, let's say, which is uh, compliant to the library, Oxively and create a feed just by exchanging HTTP commands. Okay. 
So if, if you have a software which needs to create a new feed automatically, you can do it just by programming the software in, in the proper way. Now let's uh, go to the, let's say, uh, comment of your colleague, which is basically the security part, okay? So when performing any operation, from creating feeds to modifying feeds to putting data into the feeds themselves, you need the so-called API key, which is basically a password which is given to you when you create a feed, okay? And you can have more, actually more than one of these keys each one with different permissions. So you have a key that you can use for reading, writing, modifying everything, and you can have another key that you can use, for example, just for reading, so that if you want to cooperate with someone else that you don't trust completely, you can just give him only the key for reading the data and not for modifying your feeds, for example. Okay. So, let's say, the level of security in Cyberly, but we will see also in other platform, is controlled with these passwords, which are API keys, called API keys. And if, if you want to see what they look like, they are basically sequence of strings, okay? And for example, my API keys is this one now, okay? This very, can you see it? This very long sequence of strings, and these are my permissions, read, update, create, delete, so basically everything. But I can add other keys here, and of course I can set up the permissions that, set up different permissions for this key so that then I can uh, cooperate with others just by giving them proper permissions. <clears throat> now, we have seen how to create a feed. How do I put data on the feed or on channels? Well, again, you can do it in uh, two ways. You can do it directly with HTTP requests if you know how to issue HTTP requests. You can use, for example, programs like CUR for this. No? which is a, a text line program to issue HTTP requests, or you can do it, let's say, directly by using the uh, libraries, for example, the Python libraries or the Java library, and putting data online. So what I would like to do now is to show you an example of how I can turn my PC into a sensor and how I can put the data basically online, okay, on Cybly, by using the feed that I have just created. <clears throat> so we start also uh, playing a little bit with the virtual machine. Uh, everyone has the virtual machine working or who didn't uh, manage to make it work? Everyone? Good. So let's see how slow it is. Now while it starts, let me just explain this, <coughs> which actually you can then play with when you are uh, when you have some spare time. So <clears throat> in Xively you can uh, set up the so-called triggers, okay, or notifications. That is basically when you are uh, uh, putting your data on the, the web page, you can actually set up automatic rules in order to uh, do something, okay. And by do something basically is you have capability of pushing an HTTP post to a URL of your choice, okay? 
when some condition is satisfied, for example, your data exceeds a particular threshold, or your, the average of your data in the last uh, two hours exceeds a particular threshold, and this kind of stuff. So for example, something that people generally do is to post tweets by using the Twitter API when, for example, the temperature in the office is greater than 30 degrees. Okay. I also did it uh, a couple of years ago, uh, posting on Twitter, okay, it's so hot in my office, I have to go home, something like this, okay. just to inform my boss that I was leaving. And of course, to avoid attacks, okay, there are generally some uh, uh, rules that you have to respect, for example, the minimum interval between two posts by using this trigger mechanism is at least five seconds. So you, you cannot basically start pushing a lot of HTTP requests to a URL of your choice, uh, which could be considered some sort of uh, attack versus the, the system you are pushing to. Let's see if it... Okay. <coughs> So if you manage to get an account on Xively, well actually not now, but uh, uh, in the, the next days, in the virtual machine there are already some examples that I will now explain. So then if you have an account you can, let's say, modify these examples by putting your credentials and start playing with them basically. But even if you don't, don't manage to get an account of Xively, we will now also cover ThingSpeak, so uh, it should be okay. Now the problem with my virtual machine is that when I also record the screen, it becomes incredibly slow. So you have to be patient with me, basically. <clears throat> so you should have this this uh, folder here on your desktop IoT examples uh, sorry the password is user okay it should be on the website actually and <clears throat> let me also check if we have internet connection. Yes. So I'll go here. You see, let's say I will use this feed that I have already uh, generated, with, which is the office feed. And <clears throat> let's say instead, what I will do now is basically instead of temperature, since I have no temperature data here, I will get the amount of used memory in my virtual machine and uh, I will periodically upload the amount of used memory on Xively, okay? And then we will see what happens, basically. Oh, it's really slow. It's, it's worse than Windows sometimes. Okay, let me try to explain what I will do. So, in order to do this, I will use uh, a bash script, okay? A Linux bash script, which you don't have to 
be scared about it or to worry about it. It's just a sequence of operations, okay? So something which is kind of easy to understand. And I will use the C library of uh, Xively in this bash script to put the data that I produce online. Okay, so I'm basically using what's already available on the website, which is a C program, which will do the upload for me. And I would like to open this script and show it to you, so that you understand what I'm talking about. Can you see it clearly or should I enlarge the font? Everyone can see? Okay. So what am I doing basically? It's a script that continuously update. Yes. Anyway, this is on your virtual machine, so if you <clears throat> if you open the virtual machine, then you will have the script here. Okay. Is it okay now? So, I'm basically, well, writing hello here, something really simple. Then I'm creating some variables. So, this is my API key of the feed, the one that I showed you before which of course I need if I want to put some data online. This is my feed ID, okay? So it's the identifier of my feed online. And this is the data stream or channel ID, which is the identifier of the channel inside the feed, okay? That I want to um, modify. Now, so, since I created this office feed, let me just replace the feed ID with the new feed ID, which is this number here, okay? So it's, well, it's impossible to copy. Copy. So I'll put it here. This is the feed ID. And the API key, it should be here. Okay, this is the new API key for the feed that I have created. So let me just copy it. And let me put inside the script. Okay. So now I should be able to modify the data stream ID zero, which is the one I created on my feed with the current API key. So as you can see here, there's a while loop, okay, without condition. So that means that it will, you know, endlessly run until I stop it. And what am I doing inside this while loop is, first of all, to get the amount of uh, used memory in my system. And I can do this with this line, okay. So the free command is a Unix command to get the amount of uh, memory that is used. So if I uh, run the terminal, and I run <coughs> free minus T minus M, I will get some information on the current amount of memory which is uh, used or free in my system. And this strange uh, AWK FNR equal to, it's basically, it, it goes inside these tables and select the amount of memory used. So this number here basically. So if I run this command inside the terminal, You see, I, I got, I, I've got a single number. Let me just enlarge this. 
Let everybody <clears throat> can see it. Okay. Okay. So each time I run this, I got in as a response the number of megabytes which are currently used by my virtual machine. Okay. And I can. You see, it varies a little bit. Uh, 652, 654, depending on the activities of my virtual machine, of course. So in this while loop, I'm getting this value and I'm assigning it to this variable here, data stream value, which I then will print on the terminal just to check that it's correct. And then I will use the C libraries of Xively, which I have downloaded and installed, and I I'll use the data stream update uh, utility of these libraries, which basically require requires to pass the API key, the feed ID, the data stream ID, and the new value that I want to update on my stream. Okay, so this example basically shows how to update a particular value on a particular channel in a feed. And I will continue to do this with five seconds between one update and the other one, okay? So let's see what happens if I save this and run this script. Let me just go in the directory, which is IoT examples, sadly. Is exactly update. In order to run it, I can either use sh or dot slash and the name of the script. So I will get some uh, responses, okay, coming from Xively. And basically, if you get Xively no error, it means that the update went fine. And what happens if I go on my website and I try to refresh this page? You see, I'm getting some numbers, okay? And I can actually go here in the graph, maybe using only five minutes time granularity <coughs> and basically what I'm seeing here is in real time the amount of memory used by my system okay and this is refreshing every five seconds okay so the, let's say let's try to increase the amount of memory usage by for example start adding tabs in Firefox okay so for example if I go here to I don't know Gazetta to see what happens, maybe Republic as well. Now, if I open new tabs in the browser, I would expect the amount of memory usage to increase, right? Because the system is demanding more, um, <clears throat> and I should see that the amount of memory usage actually increases. Let's see if it's true. an error now it's probably okay now it went okay probably the connection in, is not so good here so let me try to reload okay you see you can clearly see the moment where I uh, started the two new tabs because now I'm basic I have increased by almost 100 megabytes the memory usage okay now this is this was a very very simple example done with 
my PC as a memory sensor. Let's say. And you can basically extend this example to any kind of sensor, okay, to any kind of physical measurement. And you can basically, once you, are, you have your data here, you can start playing with it, okay? So you can start, for example, triggers here. You can, well, also if you want, you can add a location to geolocalize your data and start maybe doing correlations with other users and this kind of stuff, okay? Any question? Yes. Good, good question. So your colleague is asking, let's say that I have a sensor which is generating some data. How can I actually put the data online? Okay, I, I will need a, an endpoint somehow, right? Now, this is what basically IPv6 is trying to do for sensor networks, okay? Or 6 low pan is trying to do for sensor network. So at a certain point, you need your sensor to speak HTTP if you want to do this, okay? And you can do this basically with two options. The first option is you have some sort of uh, uh, intermediate device, some sort of gateway, which speaks on one side the language of your sensor and on the other side HTTP. And this is generally the scenario that you find nowadays in commercial applications. The idea, though, is to remove this gateway and make the sensor direct, directly speak with HTTP. In order to do that, they have to be connected to the internet somehow, so they need to, let's say, speak TCP IP and HTTP. And in order to do that, we need IPv6, basically. Okay? So, let's say, the community of the Internet of Things is working in order to eliminate the gateway and to make sense or directly speak with these kind of services, basically. But very good point. Um, there's, in the same folder here on your virtual machine, there's another example that does exactly the same thing that we have seen now, only using Python, okay? Now, depending on your, let's say, style in programming, what you like most, you can use C libraries or you can use Python. Python is generally a little bit more easy to, to start with, okay? So I have also put an example which uses the Python library here, and you can, uh, you can look at that, but let's um, look at it. It basically does the same stuff. The syntax is a little bit different because it's Python, so we need to respect the Python library. But the idea is the same. So we have variables to store the feed ID and the API key, of course. And then we have a while loop that basically uh, uh, get the amount of free memory in the same way as we did before with the free command. And then we use this myth, Python method xively dot data stream to set the new value that we want to give to our data stream and then we call the feed update method to update the data. And this is basically will have the same result as our bash script. So it will trigger an HTTP um, put request to uh, xively with the, the new data inside basically. <clears throat> okay, now, it's good to use Xively if you can get an account, okay, should be clear. <laughs> uh, luckily, we have this alternative, which is ThingSpeak, which is very, very similar, so mo more or less the same uh, functionalities. And it also has a very, very nice feature, which is complete integration with MATLAB. 
do you know MATLAB? Have you ever used it for research purposes? A little bit. So in the newest version of MATLAB, the I guess starting from 2013 on, there's um, basically a toolbox for speaking with ThinkSpeak. So it means that you can work with in MATLAB, get your data somehow in MATLAB, and then directly upload the data to ThinkSpeak you directly from MATLAB. Okay. The one of the differences between ThinkSpeak and Xively is that in your feed you can create up to eight channels per feed, okay? While in Xively this number is non-fixed a priori, okay? So in things in ThinkSpeak you have this limit which is eight channels per feed. Well, not a big deal actually. Now what I will uh, show you is well, a little bit on ThinkSpeak, how it works, but basically it's exactly the same as, as Xively. And then what we will do, and you can do it with me uh, on the virtual machine, we will use Node-RED, which is a very, very, uh, let's say, simple graphical interface for setting up prototypes to put some random data on ThinkSpeak. Okay, so instead of using the bash script that we have seen, which is using the libraries, we will use this Node-RED system, which will be very useful also for other uh, lectures, okay? So, let's see. <clears throat> Let me go here. So, first of all, ThingSpeak if you are interested oops. so this is thing speak okay you can sign in if you want You can register if you want, yes, it, sh it should be uh, free. And then, well, it's, uh, let's say, not so graphically good as Xively, but it has basically the same uh, features, okay? So you have your feed, and inside your, well, here, actually, they use the name channel for feed, and the name fields for channel, so it's a little bit confusing, but the concept is the same. And for example, I create this test channel here. Okay. Uh, with some data inside. And you have the same uh, features exactly. Okay, so you have API keys here as well. And there's also a help section that explains to you how to use these API keys and how to you how to use uh, to create a channel update a channel and as you can see already here the way of communicating with these cloud services is again by using HTTP commands okay that means that everything can be done very very simply using the HTTP protocol okay So if you can get an account and you can create a channel here, for example here I have created a channel which is just a test channel and has only one field, you see here you have eight possible fields inside your feed. Each of these would correspond to a data streaming sively, okay? And uh, for example, here I have said that I just want to use one field and I have named it random value. And of course, it will mean that I will put some random values in these fields, okay? <clears throat> so if you, if you have an account, if you, if you manage to create an account, you, you can try to create a channel yourself, okay? Name, is, name it what you want. 
um, what we will do now, we will try to put some data, some random data, on ThinkSpeak, on the channel that we have already uh, uh, created, using Node-RED, okay, which is a system for quickly prototyping Internet of Things solutions. So first of all, we have to start Node-RED, and you can do it in your terminal, okay, just by typing Node-RED, Node-RED, it should start. <clears throat> and to access Node-RED, you just go on the browser here. And you point to localhost at port 1880. So you type localhost, <coughs> comma, 8080. Okay, or if you want also uh, 127.0.0.1 port 180, uh, sorry, 1880. Okay, and this is not right basically. It's kind of um, difficult to explain in 10 minutes what it is about, but if you use it, you quickly understand why it's useful. So the idea of Node-RED is basically to create rapid prototyping solution by using uh, the building blocks that you have here on the left-hand panel, okay? You have a lot of functionalities and as you can imagine since we have talked about HTTP requests we will use it today for creating HTTP requests course but you can also create uh, MQTT requests MQTT is a protocol for the Internet of Things you can use um, you can attach a device and have serial input inside okay so you can directly connect your device to the web by using Node-RED then you have um, blocks for for example writing data to databases in different formats. You have blogs for accessing Twitter, sending emails, okay? So you basically can put together different blocks in order to create a very simple application in just uh, five minutes, okay? And see what happens. So what we'll do now, we will basically create a simple application that does the same stuff I've shown you in the Bash script. So every five seconds generates a, num a random number and uses an HTTP request to put this random number on ThingSpeak, okay? So how to do this? Yes. Ah, sorry. Yeah, good question. Uh, apart from, uh, let's say, already defined building blocks, Node-RED provides you with generic functions that you can put inside and basically you can then modify them with JavaScript code so that basically you can modify a, a simple example by putting your code inside, okay? Uh, I'm now explaining each of these blocks so you, you can, let's say, create them as well. So the ver first block we will use is the first one here at the top uh, left which is an inject blocked and it's basically the starting point of our application. It's the blue one here, okay? So you can take it and put it inside your uh, blank sheet. What's happening? I've lost connections. Yeah. It's a pity the wireless network is so bad here. So if you, if you take this inject block, then you perform double click on it. You can modify <coughs> the fields. For example, you can make it repeat at a specific interval here. For example, every five seconds. Okay. And what 
the purpose of this block is basically whenever you press on this button this will create something every five seconds we will see what then you can after this you can take one of these functions block okay the orange one so drop it on your uh, sheet like this and then you can connect the start block with your function block just with a wire okay like this you see you can throw a wire from your start block to the function block and in the function block what we will provide is basically the data which is needed for putting let's say the our our data on ThinkSpeak okay so as I have shown you before this data is basically composed by the API key which is the password that you need to uh, access and it's on your ThinkSpeak channel and then we want to generate some data okay which in this case will be a random number so we will use the math.random function which is a JavaScript function that creates a number between 0 and 1 and we multiply it by 10 just for you know having a number which is between 0 and 10 okay this is just for creating uh, a random data can you see it? well not that much yeah it's unfortunately I, I have no ways of increasing the size here anyway then this lecture will be posted on uh, YouTube and on the website of Professor Cesana so you can then uh, let's say um, redo this example okay so in the variable API key you should store the API key of ThingSpeak that you have on your page so if you go on ThingSpeak here on API keys here you have your key which is this sequence of strings you can take it copy it and put it inside this function okay make sure you type a new variable var api key equal to your api key api key okay and then you can do uh, the same by producing a data which is a random number okay multiply by 10 so this is a random number between 0 and 10 and then we just need to specify what is the HTTP URL that we have to contact in order to put our data on ThinkSpeak and this is actually specified on ThinkSpeak okay so if you go here on data import export there will be a uh, come on my network it's yeah okay now it's up again come on yeah I'm sorry it keeps crashing <laughs> Well, the idea is that you provide the URL at which you should send your request, which is this URL here, https api.thingspeak.com slash update, question mark, and then you pass your API key, which is here, and field one which is the data field we want to update with the data that we have randomly generated okay and then we have this return message that I will explain in a moment what is it about so don't worry about this if it's not clear now because I will 
put this example online later so you can then re-access it. So the output of this function, which is the URL that we have generated with our API key and our data, will go inside this block, which is the HTTP request block, okay, which is here in functions. We have the HTTP request block. And since we have specified in this function which is, what is the URL that we want to contact, this HTTP request block will basically perform the HTTP request at that URL for us. Okay. So we do not need to specify anything in this block. What we can do is to attach a debug block here, the green one, which is the first output block, which basically will write on this panel here, let me see, here, will write what is the outcome of our HTTP request. Okay, so basically if I start, if I click on this button here, now that my chain is complete, I see on the debug here uh, frame what is the status of my HTTP request. You can see that this, this is a success, successful request. It means that the data has arrived correctly to the website and hopefully if my internet connection is now working I should see the random data arriving in real time on ThingSpeak. Well, that's embarrassing. So let's say it's, it's really impossible to show it now because the internet connection is okay. Maybe now it works. Anyway, just to, to explain you how to run this, uh, I will put the, this lesson on YouTube together with a text file that you can import in Node-RED. And when you import this text file, you basically have all the chain of building blocks, okay? So you just have to import the text file, you have the chain of building blocks, and you can start playing with that, okay? So that is basically what I will do in order to make you play with this. <clears throat> um, there are, as I told you before, there are other systems like this, for example, six, six cents in an art is Sorry, I, I've finished, just two minutes. So Sixth Sense is another system like this. It's again uh, free, so you can get an account on that, okay? And it, the way of operation is very similar to this, so you can use the same uh, tools that we have used so far in order to put some data online. So it's a good idea also to see whether you can get an account on that and start playing with that, okay? There are some examples already on the virtual machine, so play with the virtual machine and try getting your data on line as soon as possible. Because what we will try to do in the projects is to get data from sensor networks and then put the data online. Okay, so you can see what is the complete pipeline, the complete chain from the generation of data to storing data online. Okay. That closes this lecture, and we will see, not next week, but two weeks, basically.